And uh, welcome everyone. My name is Scott Osborne and I'm the president of uh, RUCI VI, so welcome. And uh, to our webinar today on war crimes in Ukraine. And today we are very fortunate in having and welcoming Major Retired Warren Fensom. Now Warren is a very experienced and knowledgeable legal expert on international crime and military law. Some recent highlights of his career with the Canadian Armed Forces include his time as the Chief Legal Officer overseeing training at the Afghan National Army's Military Legal School in Kabul. And he was also employed as the legal advisor to HMCS Winnipeg during an anti-piracy mission in the Persian Gulf, amongst other highlights. Warren is currently employed at the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, and he is also a visiting professor on the law of armed conflict at Batter College in Sussex, UK, a, a satellite of Queen's University. Now, investigators from the International Criminal Court have been deployed to Ukraine regarding allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now, to the Western mass media, the social media, and Ukrainian government, every Russian action during this conflict in Ukraine is a war crime. Even the word genocide is tossed around quite freely. But calling any activity or action a war crime without any investigation does not make it true. But of course, many Western journalists, certainly social media users, and Ukrainian government authorities are more interested in their own circulation or in influence, influencing Western public opinion than in any legal determination. And that brings us to where Warren's expertise comes in. Today's webinar will explore the issue of war crimes in modern war, and specifically as they may apply to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Now, lastly, before I turn this over to our speaker, a few administrative points. Warren is going to talk for about 45 minutes. Then I will pose some additional questions to try to expand on Warren's talk, followed by your questions. So please use the Zoom chat or Q&A features at the bottom of your screen and make your questions brief and to the point. We end no later than 2.30 p.m. and this recorded talk will be posted to our website ASAP. So welcome Warren and thank you very much for taking the time to talk to Rusi VI today and if you are ready please begin. Thank you Scott. Um, let me can I, I'm going to move to share and we'll just pop up the screens right away and uh, we should be there. So if we can all see that yes, if you're all I seeing the see screen. It. Yep, you're all, on. All right. All right. Just a few uh, administrative comments from my own end. You'll see a, a logo at the top, which is really Queen's University. This is on my hook. It's not on them. So I'm throwing out the disclaimer right away that any, any comments, because I am sometimes opinionated, is on me and it's not on Queen's, uh, but their, their logo is sitting there. Uh, another thing I'd like to say is I do have a lot of slides, but don't be frustrated if I'm moving quickly through them, because some of them I'm putting out there so that you see later because you can access it later on your web page, because I want to show you where this law comes from and where it is. Uh, so I'm, some of it I'm going to go through fairly quickly. So if, if you're getting frustrated that, wait a minute, there was 100 words of text there, um, and I only said five, just listen to what I say, and it, the rest is there uh, to assist with you. So I'm going to really go to the general part of the law of armed conflict with war crimes to give this broad overbrush, and then dive into some specific issues with respect to the Ukraine. Now, the, where all of this started with respect to war crimes is, is of course in Nuremberg after World War II. Don't need to say anything more except that it was the genesis of an identification and a definition of what genocide was, of what uh, crimes against humanity was, and what the war of aggression, the crime of aggression would be. We kind of forgot what it was later, but it started there. And don't need to do any further history lesson than that, is to say that um, that was the modern beginning. From there, we had two, what 
is called ad hoc or mission specific to a particular uh, situation. One for Rwanda and the other one for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, again, it's history in its making, uh, but I, a couple of points I want to pull out of this. How did these ad hoc specific international tribunals get created? They got created because there was a UN Security Council resolution that gave it meat and teeth, which is one of the ways that could go. So I'm hearing that people are saying, well, we should and need another ad hoc uh, communication international tribunal for, for the Ukraine. It's not gonna happen. And that is because of course, Russia and perhaps China sit on the UN Security Council. So you're not gonna get that resolution. So I'm just pull it off from the beginning. These international tribunals are of assistance. The jurisprudence is there to be looked at. It's not binding, but it's informative. Um, so that's more of the history of what has gone on before, but we're never going to have, in my view, uh, an inter ad hoc international tribunal for Yugoslavia. It's just not gonna happen. So that gets us to the ICC. What is it? Uh, uh, basically, uh, now signed on for well over 100 countries, 130, 140 countries now, um, fairly comprehensive. And it was designed basically to deal and address with, quote, uh, from, from their uh, preamble, the most serious crimes of concern to an international community and it shall not go unpunished. In other words, the big, ugly ones that states cannot deal with or refuse to deal with themselves. The ICC is a very expensive, ponderous, slow moving, politically driven, difficult court. You don't want to put everything in front of an ICC, but there is an, a feeling with some people, well, it's gonna be all in the ICC. No, it's not. Um, because the bottom line that shows you in that slide shall be complementary to national jurisdiction. The whole idea of the ICC is that countries and states should actually do and deal with their own dirty laundry. And there was a discussion at the very beginning, if we never have a case of all of the states look after their own situations, then that's a win for the state. We know that's not the case, but the idea is if a state is investigating something, they have the jurisdiction and it basically trumps um, the jurisdiction of the ICC. So we've already had an incident where the uh, Ukrainian government has prosecuted and gotten a conviction and a sentence for life uh, for a offense under their domestic legislation for what in essence is war crime. That's how this should work. Now, going through that, the problem with and one of the major issues is jurisdiction. You may have a wonderful case uh, where it's clearly somebody has done something very egregious. It clearly is a war crime, but it's a question of having jurisdiction. Because if you don't have that jurisdiction, it doesn't matter. You don't have the authority to act. And one of the main things of the ICC is on its face, it's whether you're a signatory state party to the ICC. Russia, Belarus, and um, Ukraine are not signatory states. So this idea of you can just push it to the ICC from the very beginning is, is basically a very difficult and problematic situation. They have no authority with respect to Russia, for example, uh, with something that has happened if they're not a signatory. There is an arguable path, and I'll discuss that, um, but it's not clean and it's not simple. Doesn't mean they couldn't necessarily investigate. And we have to differentiate between investigation and actually having the jurisdiction to come through with a take it to trial and full judgment at the end. So it's just listed on the slide, how do cases get referred to the ICC? One of the major ways that state parties can ask to have something looked at. And that in fact has already happened with about 30 countries saying, would you please prosecutor, look at what's happening in the Ukraine, even though it is not a signatory. 
The other way is through the UN Security Council. We know that's not going to happen. Uh, and the other way is that the prosecutor has some ability within himself uh, with the pathway forward. But we've you've already got through the states the requests from 30 countries to go at it, along with something that the Ukraine has done. It has agreed under Section 17 of the Act to allow to cooperate with offenses which has occurred on its soil. And so even though it's not a state party, it has agreed two separate occasions to say, we agree, prosecutor, you can investigate things on our soil. So that is how the ICC prosecutor has been able to sort of say, okay, I have the authority to a limited degree to start looking at things. All right, so let, speeding right along, I realize in this, uh, these are some of the countries that have not signed on to the ICC. Actually, the Ukraine should be there, uh, that flag as well. Um, but the whole idea is, under international jurisprudence, if you haven't signed on to the treaty, you're not going to be brought before that court. Um, that is sort of one of the main themes of it. But I want to go through uh, the ICC because it's a very useful tool. What they did when they negotiated this thing is really it became a snapshot of all of the offenses which happen under the Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocol 1 to them and other aspects of international treaties, which could be a serious crime. And they basically codified it. And the fact that they have codified it is very good to point to. And I can say, if you go to the ICC website, not only will you get these definitions, but you go to the prosecutor side, you can download all of the essential elements, all of them, for each one of the charges that potentially could be before the court. I don't know why uh, the journalists haven't quite figured that out, and it may assist them in the writing of things, but it, it's all there. So I'm not going to flash this up with you, just to tell you where it is, go to the international ICC website, and you'll find the essential elements for these offenses. All right, so there's four main uh, offenses that you that you can look at. And the very bottom one will deal with the crime of aggression, also to underline that there's no way you're going to get there. But we'll go through it. So first of all, genocide. Um, genocide is a difficult one to prosecute, and, and that is because of that first line. Um, you have to prove that it's committed with an intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Now, finding that intent to destroy in whole or in part is a huge challenge for prosecutors. It's a difficult one. Quite frankly, the other war crimes are a lot easier to prove, but it's sitting there. And if you look at some of the things that's included in the definition under Article 6 of ICC as to what it is, Mm, killing of members, serious bodily harm, inflicting group. Yeah, you could say that. So how do you get to the intent? How do you prove that? Here's one thing of an example that, that did happen. Uh, the proof of intent in the, the uh, Akaseu case. Now, Akaseu was, uh, I believe, he he was the mayor of a local uh, Tybrun in, in, in a commune in in Rwanda, and he was convicted of genocide, crimes against humanity, and a whole litany of others. But you can see what they used of the evidence of intent. All of those things of the political statements and popular slogans of showing an intent to eliminate Tutsis, uh, of, and then the physical facts of bodies thrown in the river so that they go back to their place of origin, testimony of widespread uh, killing of newborns, and the public statements, whatever, all squashed in together to say, we find that intent. So, but it's a difficult one if you, if you shop it through of how do you put it all together, which is why the investigation is going on now and looking at the widespread nature of all of this is important uh, for genocide, if one could have that run. Here's a more important one. Uh, Article 8 lists war crimes. And basically, it is a shopping list from the Geneva Conventions and the protocols, and it's very helpful. 
And uh, for the international conflicts, which I've discussed, it says, see the list? The list is actually 27 separate different offenses that is listed as a possible offense uh, that it could be uh, as a war crime. And uh, let me just show you uh, what that is. And one of the first one is what's called a grave breach. And there's a listing of what is potentially, according to the ICC, what is a grave breach. And if you look at some of the allegations on Western media, um, subheading A, C, particularly D, uh, arguably um, F, we've just had a situation where two people have been sentenced to death and we don't know about the right to a fair trial. It looks like certainly evidence for the prosecutor to look at of whether there has been grave breaches. Well, the so what factor. Now, in Canada, we have what's called the Geneva Conventions Act. And what we did is we had a, uh, a very short act which says, here's the court, here's the offense, and here's the punishment, and then attached as an annex all of the Geneva Conventions and AP1 and AP2. And it gave you this. So here's the so what factor in Canada. If you cause a death, and you can see that on the slide, uh, of any person by a grave breach, you're liable for life. And in any other incidents where it could be up to 14 years. So that's where the rubber hits the road of what this means in a Canadian context. And okay, so that's that in war crimes. Again, a, a huge list of them, which we'll get to. Crimes against humanity is the third one, um, which is basically those are the most egregious, huge ones, which usually entail a, um, a large and systemic. And in fact, one of the essential elements as I've lifted out here is that it has to be widespread and systemic, which is really important for the prosecutors and investigators now and this is why they're looking at all of these things. If there's just one or two instances of rape or, or a, a, a wrongful death, that's one thing. But if it is 2,000 instances of this, then you could get to this concept of whether it's widespread and systemic, and you can get into whether it really should be at this type of level. Here's an example of Delik from uh, the former Uni Yugoslavia, tribunal. Uh, he was a deputy, uh, but he was responsible or over, overseeing and under his watch something of atrocities of a number of people in that situation. So it, it has happened uh, for that. Crimes against humanity are actually listed uh, as to what they're really talking about. And you can see that maybe in these instances, uh, murder, yeah, deportation. We know we've, we've seen evidence of reported of that. In, of falsely imprisonment, torture, yeah. Um, other inhumane acts, what might that be? Well, that has been categorized actually by a hearing in, uh, a case hearing in the former Yugoslavia that says this is what it could be. Mutilization, severe bodily harm, beatings, physical and mental injury. Um, yeah, so the, you can see that other inhumane acts might well be in play there as well. So those are the three ones that I'm pointing to, to say, you know, on, on, a, on a certain level, they reach what's called perhaps use cogens, J-U-S-C-O-J-E-N-S, basically against the laws of mankind, which gets you to the point of arguably an international concept of universal jurisdiction, which may get to you to say, no matter what, we've got something to do. It isn't perfect, but it's different than the crime of aggression, which is the fourth one, which I've put up here. The crime of aggression, we knew what it was in World War II or after, uh, but we couldn't agree even when we did the ICC. And only now in 2018, did we get 30 nations to sign on as to what the actual definition was? So it is a creature of statute, a creature of the ICC. It hasn't reached that level of consensus of what the definition is in terms of regression. 
particularly when lots of countries are saying, hey, under the right to protect and other reasons, we have the need and the right to go in and do something, whereas somebody else would say, oh, it looks like aggression. So the definition isn't there. And for sure, there's no way that uh, the crime of aggression, even though it's spoken about, is going to have its day. But what is it? I put it out there as a definition so that you see it. Um, and it's right on the money. An invasion or attack, a bombardment against the properties, a blockade, an attack by the states of land, sea, and air. It's there. And there's no doubt that the offense is there. Uh, it's just that you don't have the jurisdiction to run it. Um, so it looks like a slam dunk, but you don't have the authority to go after Russia on this account. And just going on with the added additions of aggression, I want to point you to F, the action of a state in allowing its cherished territory, which it is placed at the disposal of another to be used by that state. Think of Belarus. Belarus isn't a party either, but even under the war of aggression, Belarus could, under that definition, have been called to account, but it's not a signatory either. Now, Canadian law, because it's Canadian audience, I want to speak to you about what the acronym is, CACWA, the Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Act. Uh, so we have this uh, in Canada to adopt the ICC regulations so that we can also follow it. And under that, we have um, said that we have jurisdiction over anything that happens in Canada or anywhere. And if so, we, we have them, we can prosecute in Canada regardless of that individual's nationality or where they have been committed. In other words, if we've got them, that universal jurisdiction aspect is that we can have them. Oh, have we ever done it? Yes, we have. Uh, in uh, Mr. Uh, Munhazia, if I pronounced his name right, um, was Rwanda, and the Quebec Superior Court uh, found him guilty of genocide, crimes against humanity, boom. So we've done it. It's, it's Canadian law that we can roll through this. I want to speed with you in criminal responsibility um, that it's not only the person that's actually pulled the bullet, but command responsibility, particularly, particularly at the ICC level, of those who have planned, instigated, ordered, or committed. Again, because the idea is to get at the big fish. And that includes commanders. So not only Putin, but his generals beneath him if they're aware that somebody has committed or is about to commit and they don't take, take steps to stop it or to and launch disciplinary could be liable for itself. Now, this isn't brand new. Uh, this has been around for some time. And I'm going to bring you back to the Kurt Meyer case, a Canadian uh, situation because it involved the death of Canadian prisoners of war, uh, where Meyer, in, and it basically said, why, why are we taking prisoners? We don't have enough food. Implicitly saying, get rid of them. And he was convicted uh, for uh, basically inciting his troops to deny quarter. So command responsibility, the idea has been around for a long time. Also coming from Nuremberg, the fact that you were doing it under orders isn't going to fly. Uh, I was following orders is not an excuse. It might be at the sentencing stage, but not at the guilty stage. And of course, uh, Yodel tried that and resulted in uh, something against it. In Canadian law as well, we have articulated this a little further and said, depending on whether the order was not, uh, you can use it as a defense if the order was not manifestly unlawful, which is a nice phrase, manifestly unlawful. And I want to describe what that is because it does flesh it out in terms of the orders or what the Russian soldiers might be saying, I was told to do it. It was not manifestly unlawful. Under the Canadian section, we've made it clear, a hey, orders to commit genocide and crimes against humanity are unmanifestly unlawful. Forget it, it's not going to sell. Now we, we've gone further than that. Uh, we had a Supreme Court of Canada decision in called R versus Finta, which was an extradition case of moving a what was a, a prison guard back to extraditing back to Europe because of what happened in World War II. 
And he was saying, I just was following orders. And here's the definition, which is good Canadian law, because it comes from the Supreme Court of Canada, of what a manifestly on order is. Because you're supposed to follow orders, but it's this. To qualify as a manifestly unlawful order, it must be one that offends the conscience of every reasonable right-thinking person. It must be an order which is obviously and flagrantly wrong. And I've used the example, that's my wording of King Harold killing babies under two. There's just no way. Uh, so um, that is what a manifestly order is. Have we used it in Canada? Yes, unfortunately, we've had this situation. Um, and I'm using the example of orders that happened in Somalia. Um, and you can see actually the chain of command, how it went sideways. Abuse them if you want, but I don't want gunfire to... Uh, your task is to capture and abuse, said the captain, and that ruled down to the sergeant, I don't care what you do, just don't kill the guy. And of course, that is what happened. So an example of manifestly uh, unlawful orders, which they were all held to account and either reduced in rank or imprisoned uh, because of that as officers. Okay, so that's whole scale uh, zap to targeting. Uh, to the Ukraine thing, but let's, let's, the law actually is quite bloody simple. It's in additional protocol one, articles 48 to about 58. And in those two or three pages, it sets it all out. The law itself is quite simple. The problem is in the application and getting it right, because what can go wrong will go wrong. Weapons don't work right. Intelligence is wrong. Communications fail. Uh, even trying to do it right, things go backwards. But the law itself is this, you can target two things, only two things, a military objective and a combatant, those you can apply force against. So if it's not that, it's something else. It is a civilian object or a civilian. There's the four categories, military objective, civilian objects, combatants and military objectives. So you can only target against two. Combatants, well, let's just talk about that. And military objectives. Here it is, what is a military objective? Is it all of those buildings uh, which you're firing rockets in, which look like 17 stories high in downtown Kiev? There's a definition of a military objective listed from additional protocol one, article 52. It has to, by its nature or location, make an effective contribution to military action and offer taking it out a definite military advantage. So it has to fit that definition of what a military objective is. Now, if I have 17 grandmothers with snipers on the 17th floor, maybe I could make the argument that doing something with that 17th floor with those grandmothers uh, is um, offering a military advantage. I doubt it, but looking at it from the Russian perspective, you have to say that taking out that building offers you a military objective, or it shouldn't be targeted, should not be targeted, period. That's property. Combatants is people, and normally it's a member of an armed force, which gets us a little fuzzy with respect to Afghanistan, or pardon me, uh, Ukraine, with respect to who is a combatant. So other than it's usually easy. It's the person in the uniform, except those people that are medics or chaplains, and they have a direct right to participate in the hostilities, which means they can be also targeted. Combatants also implies that they're a member of an armed force, uh, which means that they are under command by somebody, that they're organized, and that they're command from somebody, explicitly under some kind of command and control system. The difficulty is, is when you get into militias and informal groups. And additional protocol one actually deals with this. It includes in the definition of members of militia and other members of volunteer corps. And we've got that in the Ukraine. And this is why this thing that you're seeing of people wearing blue coats and yellow armbands is important because it is their own signature way, as you can see from this, uh, I believe it's um, World War II, of uh, a insignia of a distinctive sign recognition, recognizable at a distance to say, 
I am a member of the armed force. I can be a target, but I'm also claiming that I am uh, a member uh, to use the right of force. And I think here's another part where they fleshed it out a little more. This idea with basically militia groups, it's not a suicide pact, that it, they, as long as they carry their arms openly during the engagement. So grandmother with her shotgun may put the shotgun away until she is, during the engagement, going to use it. Uh, so there's some subtleties in there in terms of the, the ability of militias of when they are civilians and when they are potentially um, combatants. Combatant status is important. Why? Because you're allowed to shoot. Fortunately, you're also allowed to be shot as a legitimate target, and you become or arguably have prisoner of war status, uh, which gets to this mucky thing. The problem in, in Afghanistan and also is a problem, uh, I'm sure which is going to raise its head in Ukraine, is DPH, those persons who are directly participating in hostilities. If you are an unprivileged belligerent, but you're still shooting, then you can be targeted uh, while you are directly participating in the hostilities. That's the phraseology. It really doesn't get that far than that, which means um, there's a lot of vagueness as to the, the centers around it and how far it may go. So remember the phrase direct participation in hostilities, particularly when we have I think uh, even in Kiev, they, they handed out 25,000 uh, rifles to people saying they're all at the front. Um, all right, so let's get at uh, some more genera general things as well. Uh, civilian populations shall not be the object of attack. That's clear. Note the next one, uh, spreading terror amongst the civilian is prohibited. I don't know why they're shelling all these vehicles other than to spread terror, but I raise that. Uh, that in itself, under Article 51, bracket 2, is an offense in itself. And the key one is indiscriminate attacks. And this is where I think we're really going wrong. If you're using a method, you don't care if it's going at civilian objects or not. You don't care where it's going. You're just firing off the ammunition without discriminating. Or you're using a weapon system that is so inaccurate that it cannot identify or aim with a measured force and a military objective as opposed to a civilian one, it's indiscriminate. And it is a serious crime, as you can see there, if it, uh, it is firing without distinction against a civilian or civilian objects. is one of the specific crimes listed as war crime under the Geneva Conventions uh, and, or the ICC. It's not to say things don't get hurt. And, and I want to point out Article 57.2. This is the collateral damage phrase. You do not see the word collateral damage in the Geneva Conventions. This is as close as you get. It says, look, even if you've identified something as a military objective, but by attacking it, you see that it may cause incidental loss to civilians or civilian objects or property. And that would be, quote, in excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. You shall not do it. Excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. I don't need to tell you with respect to what we've seen in the movies or on the television screens of the, of the extent of the devastation which is happening in the cities. And I think that is a repeat. We don't have to do that. OK, I want to move to there. And what is the test for commanders? Do everything feasible. All right, let me just move to what I want to do here. Let's go right at the Ukraine. So in the very beginning stages, there was a lot of things about Chernobyl. Could a nuclear plant be attacked? The suggestion was in the media that it's totally unlawful. Uh, so I want to go at it and say, well, it's not necessarily the case. Is there a specific section under additional protocol one that deals with installations containing what's called dangerous forces. Specifically, it says dams, dikes, and nuclear electrical generating stations. Oh, what a surprise. So it 
if you read the first part, and this is where it's been quoted in the papers, shall not be attacked even if they're military objectives. And there's a sign that you should put on there to say it's, it's a dangerous force, don't go near it. Actually, the wording is a little different. If you look at it, and I've underlined that, if an attack may cause the release of the dangerous force and consequent sphere loss amongst the civilian population. So it is possible to attack a nuclear power station, possible, but not if it's going to release or may cause the release of dangerous forces. Uh, so how do you do it? Uh, if it's really necessary, if you have to do it, if it is a military objective, I'm going to suggest that's the role of the special forces to go in and either end parachutes or whatever, take it out in a way that you do not release the, the force. All right, let's look what happened in real time. Here's Ukraine's power plants, and um, the one I'm speaking about is Chernobyl and Zaporizhia. I probably am pronouncing that wrong. This, I think, was lifted from about March. I'm not sure whether Zaporizhia is uh, still continuing or not. But these are the ones that I want to speak about. First of all, Chernobyl, because it got so much play. There it is. You'll see that even the tower is actually gone. It is not a military objective. It has been shut down for over 30, 40 years. It has no military advantage whatsoever. I can't think of any reason known to man why you'd be sending anywhere near it other than to perhaps to a flanking position to hold the Ukrainians from going around uh, to, to get at your supply line. I have no idea why they were there. Uh, so it doesn't even hit the test of a military objective, let alone a, uh, the special rule for dangerous forces. But here's the other one of the other the Zaporizhka, uh, which is the largest nuclear plant going around. And um, here is, if we can get it, uh, here's film, I'm going to suggest this is exhibit A, of uh, the attack against it. And you, I'm not going to say that the, that attack is done in a way that it may not cause the release of dangerous forces. It looks to me that I don't know what they were thinking, but um, in a way it goes, they continue, continue to fight. Uh, firing right at it. So, exhibit one um, with that. All right, so let's move on to one that's more coming and getting a lot of play right now of cluster munitions. Cluster munitions for many countries of the world are banned. Can't use them anymore. However, Russia is not a party to it, and therefore they're not bound uh, under that rule by Russia, they can use them. Uh, but what are they? Basically, and, and here it, it sort of underlines the process, um, little bomblets that opens up in the air and then drops out in this, in this example up to 200 little bomblets that filter down. And so it causes all sorts of smaller bombs, basically an area denial a device. Uh, does it have a use? I'm going to say yes. It's probably one of the easiest ways I can think of of taking out an airfield. Just pocket the runway, and in one strike, um, you can you can pit it and perhaps deny that airfield. So it may have a purpose. The problem is with all of these, obviously, is against civilians. There's no way because it is so indiscriminate because it's just uh, a prolifera of small bomblets. Uh, that if it's done or fired in anywhere where there's civilians, it's probably going to be found, probably is, um, indiscriminate by its very nature. Here's a real look at what they look like in time, and you can see that it's just, in this one, a bunch looks like tennis balls of small bomblets. Here's another type that come down. And um, another example is um, you can use it by artillery which gets you a spalling effect, and uh, the same kind of thing as an aerial denial. Although I think the best thing is this. This is not Ukraine. This is uh, Chechnya in 2008. And you'll hear an explosion, which means it's the explosion in the air, and then you'll see the net effect of it. And you'll get the idea what's happening.
Okay, so you, you get the idea. It's not one explosion. It happens because they're coming down a little bomblets. There's a distinctive signature to using this kind of cluster munition. Now, the next one's more important, and it happens fairly quick. Downtown Kiev. Watch this. Whoop, there we are. Okay, same kind of signature, downtown civilian population. So that's the best footage that I could come up with of saying, yeah, it certainly looks that they were using them, um, which is indiscriminate in my argument, and I'm gonna get it. All right, so I want to speak to something which arguably may have been used, but they haven't got it yet, is thermobaric, which is as close as you can get to a nuclear weapon um, that has been around. Um, I was very concerned about the, the metal shed that this was going to happen. It is, you can see here, the Russian version has a blast effect of up to 600 meters. That's six football field. Um, and uh, it works by basically um, a two-stage thing. A huge, very high explosive released in the air, boom, and then an igniter after that to set it off. Um, so it creates almost like a miniature nuclear bomb of sucking in the oxygen and then a very kinetic explosion outward. Um, there has been arguments to say these have been used and obviously they're pretty indiscriminate by their nature. I do point out that weapon there because it's gonna come back as to a, a mobile launcher for this type of thing. Um, and here we are an example uh, where I was concerned that this might happen in the bunker. Don't know whether it's going to happen. It's still sitting there. I am pointing out to you this, uh, the picture of this of, oh, look at that. Um, that was taken in March, um, which certainly looks like it was a projector for one of those. So it's to be looked at. So the last few slides, I'm just uh, grabbing different types of things to say, look, Acts or threats of violence, the primary purpose is to spread terror, is prohibited. Oh, really? So spreading terror amongst the civilian, prohibited in itself. Respect for civilian property shall not be the object of attack. Again, Article 1. There it is. That's the law. Uh, besieged or surrounded areas. Now, it isn't binding, but the party shall endeavor to include local agreements to get the civilians out of there. Has that happened? Not well, but uh, it's happened to a certain extent. This arguably has happened, the taking of hostages, which is seen as a grave war breach, grave crime, under Common Article 3 and others, the taking of hostages, judicial executions and outrageous on dignity. Um, so I list, list that. And here's one that has raised its head to, which is deportations. We know that there is a significant evidence that um, Ukrainian people have been taken into Russia. The idea of mass transfers and deportations to your zone is coming out of World War II, very clearly prohibited. So that in itself, um, it needs to be looked at and examined. And if partial evacuations should take place, it's only for imperative security reasons and then only to the occupied areas, not into Russia. So uh, that needs to be looked at as well. Starvation, um, fairly evident, um, whether that's taking place or not, but there is an obligation not to attack, destroy, or remove objects indispensable for the survival of the civilian population. I think we're seeing evidence that that could be in play here. And also Russia, in the areas where it is occupying, shall, here's the authority, shall, to the fullest extent available to it, provide clothing, bedding, shelter, and other su supplies essential to the civilian population. Hasn't necessarily done that too, but that is the obligation which sits on Russia. And other things in occupation, 
of humane treatment for the local people because they didn't ask this to be part of this. And the local Ukrainian people should be protected from acts of violence, protection of public curiosity, insults, and respect for their manners and customs. Again, um, all of the things that the law says uh, needs to be covered in this case. All right, so I've spoken quickly, I know I have, uh, but I wanted to get through that and also to show you a few of the things uh, that needs to be looked at, particularly targeting uh, and command responsibility with respect to that targeting from the generals on down, Putin on down, and um, other specific aspects of their means and methods of warfare, which are frankly, uh, very blunt. All right, so um, there, there we have Rumpel of the Bailey. Uh, I am going to hold off now and stop screen share. Are you with me, Scott? Yep. All right, so I'll, I'll come back to me. Um, okay, thank you very much, Warren. Uh, that was very good. Um, while we let the audience uh, sort of uh, assemble some questions, I've got some questions for you. Uh, and you've probably touched on all of these questions to one degree or another, but maybe you can expand a little bit. And what is the difference or difficulty between the International Criminal Court holding perpetrators to account once hostilities have concluded, which has been the normal past practice, and currently now with the ICC uh, conducting their investigations within the context of an ongoing war in the Ukraine. What are the difficulties that come from that? <laughs> difficulties, challenges, and uh, also opportunities. Uh, any any um, policeman will say the first that I can get into a crime scene, the better so that it is fresh, so that I can preserve the evidence for an investigation later is critical. And as time goes by, memories erode, you can't find the people, the evidence is gone. So the sooner that you can get in there, the better to preserve the evidence. So even though that is an ongoing conflict now, that's on the positive side that it is of assistance, particularly when we're looking at trying to identify, is there large scale systemic um, aspects to this of how did this all take place? The problem is you can only get so far because you're never going to be able to interview the other side. Um, but you've at least preserved the crime scenes as much as you can. So it is a good first step. It's also dangerous, uh, obviously, because you're in a, you're in a combat zone. Uh, I'm, I'm not sticking up my hand to go, go out there. Sorry, I've done my time. Um, um, and it's not easy, and you're only going to get so far. Uh, and, but that first step is, is important in order to get that evidence. That's what happened in former Yugoslavia. People went uh, sometimes 10 years after the fact, digging up mass graves, <sighs> trying to stitch it all together with DNA samples, whatever. Now it's much fresher, it's easier to do. Um, is it complex? You're not gonna have, unless you've got, it just so happens that you know, they, they arrested a, a young soldier who confessed, uh, yeah, I, I shot the guy. Um, unless you get that kind of case, you're not, you're only going to take your investigation so far, but it's not a bad thing if you can do it. Over. Okay, thanks for that. Um, something I noticed is that the Ukrainian government has said that they will not cooperate with the International Criminal Court mm -hmm. in investigating any war crimes allegations against Ukrainian citizens or soldiers. That, that's probably quite understandable. But how does the International Criminal Court get around that? Or is there no way around that? That's an interesting one. And now I'll be honest with you, I haven't exactly seen their wording of saying they're not going to cooperate. However, bear in mind that Ukraine is not a signatory to the ICC. The only way that the prosecutors are in there now is that on two separate occasions, Ukraine has said to them in 2013 and 2015, we agree to participate for crimes to be investigated on our soil. So they've already said that. And one of the sections, I believe it's 17 of the act says, 
if you invite them in and agree, then you also agree to cooperate. Okay, so on its face then, one of the terms of the ICC coming in and investigating is that you're investigating it all. And because the, the prosecutor has to be impartial, and the UN has to be seen as impartial, there's no way that it can say, well, we're just dealing with Russians, we're not dealing with the Ukrainians. Can't do that. Um, now, as a matter of politics, though, particularly when Ukrainian government has basically said, all hands on deck, we're all fighting the Russians, we authorize you to use force against the Russians, it's pretty hard to say, Grandma, pick up your AK-47, but we're also going to bring in these investigators from the ICC to see whether you did it right or wrong. Uh, I don't think so. So in terms of the politics of it, I can see where they're saying, well, we're really focusing as much as possible on the Russians. And by the way, if it's Ukraine, we've got it. And that's because if, if our people do something, we will investigate it and we will look after it, which is what the ICC says, yeah, that's how we want to do business. Now, prosecutors don't like sharing. Investigators don't like sharing. The good way to compromise your case is to sort of let other people see what's going on. It, it gets damaged. So on its face, normally the investigators are tight. Uh, how can the ICC get around this? Interpol does it all the time with agreement between prosecutors of sharing information. And so it can, on a political level, be done. And also, let's face it, the ICC is a bit of a political beast. They, as a practical matter, to say, yeah, what we're really looking at is Russia. Uh, but if we do come across something, we'll tell you. And here, there it is. There. So there's kind of some kind of partial cooperation, but for the consumption of the Ukrainian people, I can see them saying, we're, we're, we're not asking the ICC to investigate us. That's not what we're doing. I can see them taking that that position as a practical matter, given the situation there. Does that explain it? Yeah, I think so. I think it, it basically what you've said is it's not, uh, if the Ukraine had said, we're not gonna cooperate uh, with the ICC in investigating our own citizens, that it's it, it's not a, a, a fait accompli. There are ways to sort of get around it. And to a certain degree, they've already opened the door, as you indicated, by allowing the ICC in the country, uh, mm -hmm. because there has to be a certain degree of it's either for everyone or it's for no one. It yep. can't be just for some people and not for others. Uh, that's right. Uh, let me let me just add to that the, the so what factor. What if they're not cooperating? Actually, the section under 17 says if the prosecutor comes to that decision, what can he do? And it basically says he reports back to the UN Security Council which in this case, it's not being driven by that, so that's an out, or reports back to the other consortium of countries that have asked it to be investigated. So in a political thing, the prosecutor goes back and say, we're not helping. Um, then the act goes silent as to what happens from there. And so you might say that at the end of the day, as a practical matter, the, they might say, okay, we're not supporting this or funding um, the, this investigation any further, and funding is a key part because these investigations are expensive and the ICC is expensive itself, always is looking for money. Um, but uh, that's it. If they're not cooperating, it becomes a political issue uh, and is going to be sitting at that level and likely behind closed doors to come to some kind of understanding, which I've kind of highlighted that I think it would probably go. Tell us if you found a Ukrainian and hand it over to us. And, and that's as far as the cooperation goes. Over. Okay, I think that's good. Um, I think it leads into the next question that I've got here, which you and I had had a chance to discuss a little bit before uh, we started the webinar today. And that is that a senior spokesman for President Zelensky on the 3rd of March, publicly urged civilians, I think it was through tweets and that sort of thing, official tweets, uh, publicly urged civilians to wage guerrilla war or total popular resistance is the other term that he used and attack Russian soldiers. 
Now, this was then reinforced by the Ukrainian parliament passing a law, effective as of the 7th of March, allowing civilians to open fire on Russian soldiers. Now, how does that fact sort of complicate <laughs> war crimes allegations, uh, etc.? Well, it's 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 of two it's of two levels. First of all, you can understand why they did that because yeah. they're totally outgunned and outmanned on a, by a factor of one to ten. Uh, so it's all hands on deck if you can possibly get them out there. And there there is a concept known levy en masse, a wonderful French phrase of we all rise up with pitchforks and drive off the invader. Um, and that is recognized as part of a self defense thing. It's actually built into in, into the, the, the additional protocol one. Uh, so this concept of raising up and, and fighting off um, as a levy on mass before you get organized still exists, but then it fades because the idea is if you've got an organized army, maybe you don't need a levy on mass. But what he's done or what Ukraine has done is basically create an informal or a formal militia and recruited them and said, otherwise it would be murder if you killed somebody, a Russian too, uh, to say you are doing this as part of a militia with us. Now the idea, again, in, in the recognized in additional protocol one, if they're carrying their arms openly, as I discussed, uh, or at least during the engagement, uh, if they're compliance with the law of armed conflict, if they're in some kind of command and control system of how organized they are, then they might qualify, there's a good argument, and that bill helps them to say, we've basically recruited them as part of the armed force of Ukraine. Now, unfortunately, I, I've seen the, the text and I can identify that it looks like Ukrainian, but I can't read it <laughs> in terms of, of what the actual wording is, but it gives their own people comfort to say, I'm not gonna be turned around by my own government and accused of murder because I went out and did this to protect my homeland, they've been authorized to do it. Your question though is, what does this mean? What does it mean to the, uh, the other side in a possible argument? And I'm, I'm gonna put on my Russian hat. I'm gonna put on my Russian hat to say, you've basically made every position, every civilian, a military, the combatant and where they're living and hanging out with their AK-47s on the 17th floor of downtown Kiev, a military objective. I don't think it's going to fly, but that's the argument to say you turn them all into military objectives. We and 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 there we are. Um, why does it not go that far? And that is the additional protocol one says this if you cannot decide whether it's a military objective or not the default is that it's presumed to be a civilian okay so if you can't tell if it's 50 50 then you have to assume that it is a civilian uh, until you get into this concept which i mentioned of direct participation in hostilities um, and the argument of um, farmer by day, uh, assault soldier by night comes into play of when do you get to be a civilian and say I, I, I'm entitled to be respected and protected and can't be targeted or I am now a combatant uh, because I'm wearing this armband uh, because I put it on an hour ago and now I'm entitled to shoot. Um, it gets fuzzy and hazy in the details and does it, is it going to make diff things difficult at the end of the day? Yeah, and it's going to be argued a lot. DPH, direct participation in hostilities, and what does that mean? Um, direct participation in hostilities says it has to reach a certain threshold of harm as well. So when you have all the civilians standing out in front of the Russian troops coming in and throwing eggs at them, or basically using a lot of excluded deleted, is that a threshold of harm? The answer is no, uh, and and that does not give them to say, well, you're combatants, so I'm just going to mow you all down. No, uh, but if they were taking the next step of a direct, let's say, Molotov cocktails, oh yes, then that is a direct participation in the hostility, direct threshold of harm, 
then they can be targeted. For how long? Well, like you get into the grave thing of what DPH actually means, and the authorities are all over the board on that. Uh, and it's one of the most difficult ones we had in Afghanistan, and also it's going to be a difficult one, I'm going to suggest. Even if the Russian soldiers are trying to do it right, uh, that, that is a challenge for them and their command. Over. Yeah, I know in Afghanistan, uh, one of the things that we looked at was the issue of intent. And just because somebody was carrying a rifle, for example, at, at least in Afghanistan, was not always considered to represent intent. Uh, but someone concealing themselves on a rooftop of a village building with a cell phone and perhaps a pair of binoculars observing the deployment of our people uh, doing something, uh, that could be considered intent, and in many cases, those people were killed. So would intent be involved in this sort of decision-making as well? It would be, and, and definitely is. And in fact, if, if you go to the, the concept of training of the, of the special forces, they, they make it even simpler of threat or no threat. Uh, threat, you're targeted. No threat, you, you don't fire, period. Um, so... It, it is an exceedingly difficult one to fly on the battlefield, except when you can say, uh, you, you, when you see it, you, you know it. Um, but for every gray area, there's a, pardon me, hackneyed expression, another 50 shades of gray to go with it, uh, of, of trying to identify what the intent is. And certainly in Afghanistan, where every shepherd was carrying a, a rifle because it was jewelry for men, um, it's, it's a problem, and uh, the fact that in Kiev, I believe, 25,000 rifles were handed out to the civilians, uh, does that mean that if you're an untrained Russian soldier, that are you entitled to kind of say, I'm presuming that every one of them has the intent to shoot me? Um, it makes it problematic. Um, but you got to win the war first, so I understand why Ukraine did it. Um, it's, it's the one thing they have is morale. Uh, so arming them and saying, okay, even the lowest person is, is in the fight, that's what's keeping them going, quite frankly. Over. Okay, um, that's, I think that's good. That certainly covers uh, the topic, gives room for, uh, room for thought. Uh, we had a question that you and I had sort of discussed that might get quite lengthy, but uh, I only see one question from the audience at the moment, mm. so we're doing well for time. So I want to go into that question and, and uh, not necessarily go into a real in-depth uh, onto it, but can you briefly explain the concept of head of state immunity? And in, th in that regard, I'm thinking about uh, uh, President Putin himself mm. uh, as a head of state. How would that concept apply to the conflict in, in Ukraine in reference to crimes against humanity, war crimes, et cetera? And what is the impact on international criminal court investigations given again, which we've touched on several times that neither Russia nor Ukraine are signatories to the international criminal court. So can you sort of explain that concept of head of state immunity, what it means? Yep, yep. To, um, I'm, I'm going to try because <laughs> It's, it's fuzzy around its edges. And there's really two different types of head of state immunity. That person who is really the very heart of it, the, the, the king, if you will, uh, the prime minister, the, the, the chief of defense staff, at that level, uh, that there is this concept in international law that they are immune and really it's state on state issues and not individual. So that while they're still in office, they have this personal immunity. There is another aspect of that, which we're probably a little more familiar with, is um, ambassadors and those types of things. You're not going to complain that the Japanese ambassador who, who handed them off saying, we're declaring war on you. That was his job, his functional Im Im uh, immunity, which is recognized in an international treaty uh, about this. And so the one of the international norms is that a head of state is immune to these types of things. Now, it gets murky from there. When you look at the 
ICC, there is a specific section to say, if you're a state member, you waive that. You waive it. You don't, we're not going to go there. So that the head of state, i.e. Putin, uh, or uh, Zelensky, um, cannot claim this basically an administrative thing saying, it's not that I didn't do it, it's not a defense, but administratively I'm immune. You cannot go at me. Um, that is waived if you are a state member. So this is critical that Russia is not a state member. So you go back to this concept of saying head of state immunity. It's in competition with something else, which I spoke of this use cogens of this larger and bigger idea of crimes against humanity of there's no way that you can plead the fifth if you have the will of, of, uh, of this so that um, it's competing and the authorities go both ways as to does use cogens type things crimes against humanity trump this idea of uh, head of state immunity some say yes it does others say it doesn't particularly those to say there's another aspect of what there is actual treaties to say how do you interpret treaties the, the vienna convention on treaties to say an agreement between two countries should not be binding on a person that hasn't agreed and in this case if you're saying well we we've created this icc you're going to be bound regardless it flies in the face of that so there are these tensions which have not been resolved. The cases have gone both ways. And those cases, quite frankly, are not binding in any event, because they, there is not what's called stare decisis in, in these international uh, tribunals. Uh, they're not binding, they're informative. Now, it may be that the International Court of Justice, which is another court, um, which decides state to state, could look at this and make a decision. It hasn't been asked to. And part of the reason they don't want to do that, I'm going to suggest, is they're afraid of getting the wrong result. Um, so uh, it's uncertain. But certainly with Mr. Putin, who's now allowed himself the legislation to stay into power since to 2036, another 14 years, and he's probably going to expire from old age, if not before then. Um, he's going to be in, possibly in power for that long. So it's still going to be an argument 14 years from now. Over. Uh, I haven't got any questions from the audience. I did have one, and I, I think I pushed the wrong button and I lost it, but yeah. it, was, it was along the lines of, and I may get it wrong, so I apologize to whoever submitted the question, but it was along the, the lines of, does the United Nations have any ability, at, either through the United Nations Security Council or the General Assembly, in overruling uh, a party who wishes to, for example, um, uh, abuse their authority on the Security Council for the, sake, for the sake of argument? Is there any way that there's any international humanitarian law that allows uh, an overruling of that in any way, shape, or form? Nope. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I have to be blunt. Uh, not unless you rewrite uh, the UN Charter, because the way that it's structured um, that is that there is no form, even if all of the countries of the world agreed, certainly political pressure, absolutely political pressure to say all of the other countries agree that you're, you're a bad apple. But uh, there's if you're on the Security Council, you have that veto, and there's nothing that in the current structure to say that you cannot use it. Um, it's, th th there is that not the alternative, except that this whole area is, I'm going to say, changing. Um, World War II changed it, and then we got into this whole thing, and I walked you through the various uh, ad hoc courts that came up before we came to here, um, it is still changing and evolving. But I want to underline one thing. This is the International Criminal Court. The domestic courts have a say in this too. In other words, if Putin is not going to be doing any, 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 any visits to Ukraine anytime soon, because if the Ukrainians get 
use, Ukrainians get a hold of him, they could prosecute him under the domestic law. And, and that is the other aspect of this, um, that uh, you, you have to bear in mind that each country involved could and normally does look after their own dirty laundry. Uh, I've pointed out examples in Canada where actually these were courts marshals. Uh, if you Google it, war crimes in Canada, you're not going to come up with that. But in essence, they were things that happened on a battlefield or a war crime situ situation. Um, so that they actually were courts marshals. Uh, and I've given you the example of something that happened in the Quebec Superior Court. Domestic law. So we have to bear in mind that uh, that is in play as well and possibly could. And I'm going to suggest if there is a regime change, and I'm, it's a big if, I grant you that. And it, it's happened before in the Sudan, for example, where the former president was said, his, his, his time is done and over to you, we are now waiving jurisdiction. Um, or in, in the time of Saddam Hussein, what happened to him? Well, it wasn't an international criminal tribunal. It was the Iraqi people on its own courts tried and convicted him and sentenced him as a result of his own conduct with respect to his using chemical weapons on his own people. Neat and tidy domestic law regime change. Um, I'm going to suggest that there hasn't been too many changes in Russia that hasn't been uh, by a free and clear voluntary election and people normally have been pushed out or at least sent to their Dachau with a, like, uh, uh, um, Yeltsin with a, with a bowl of vodka. Uh, that, um, it, it, that country works differently and, and we can't really put our Western norms to say this is how it's going to play out. Regime, regime change is possible. And economic sanctions might assist in doing that. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily 100% effective, but it's not ineffective either. Over. Okay, I've got a question from Al Hoffman. Uh, he missed the first part of the presentation, so I think you kind of covered that. This the answer to his question. <clears throat> Excuse me, but if you could give it to him again. His question is, who is the equivalent to Crown Council that determines if there is a sufficient evidence to lay a charge. And of course, this would depend on the institution doing the investigation. So if you could just sort of repeat that, please. Yeah, okay. Well, in inside the ICC, there is a defined person, the prosecutor, and there's only one, and then he's got his office. Uh, but that's the person who has the authority to act with his jurisdiction to say, one, to investigate, and two, then to carry the case to say whether he's got a reasonable chance of conviction and jurisdiction to take it to trial. So it's that person uh, within the ICC. With respect to domestic legislation, it is the same depending on which way the, the country is structured and set up. In Canada, for example, we have basically a lot of criminal law is administered on the provincial level. So we have provincial prosecutors with the head of prosecution service, as well as a separate federal grouping for federal offenses. So it depends on the structure of the country. And as I understand it, Ukraine is very much uh, centralistic in terms of a single prosecutor that has an office sitting in Kiev. So as I understand it, that's the structure. And that person is setting up his own investigators to, to investigate uh, what has happened out on the battlefield. Over. Okay, thanks for that. I haven't got any more questions from the audience, but I was just wondering if, um, do you have any final comments or thought, thoughts you wish to add uh, regarding your presentation on war crimes in Ukraine? Maybe things that, uh, or issues that the audience should try to uh, focus in on as takeaways from your presentation? Yeah, and my apologies because, you know, this trying to squash what really should be a, a, a three months university course in into 45 minutes I, I had to I had to cherry pick and, and 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 give you the broad brush on things I realized I went quickly through it uh, but that is to underline that 
the expectation in the media of, of having a slam dunk win, uh, that this is not going to happen overnight, that the prosecutions, if they ever do happen, they have to have somebody before the courts, and it's going to take years. And uh, I can say that uh, going back to my time in uh, the former Yugoslavia, uh, that there was what was called the process of sealed indictments, so that the prosecutors would basically find there's sufficient evidence to issue a warrant, but it's sealed. No one knows that it exists um, because they didn't want to tip that person off. And part of the things that we were doing years after the fact was having a list of what was called PIFWICs, persons indicted for war crimes, and finding them and getting them and bringing them to The Hague. And part of that process is handing your charges, here you are, fellow, and now you're on a, a, a herc to, uh, to The Hague. Um, so this process is going to be years uh, beyond the normal cycle of um, the, the average media. Um, and it will play out for many years as things are unfolded and more information comes forth. And we get the Russian side of things. We certainly are not getting it now. We're getting uh, propaganda spin, not surprising. Uh, but uh, we don't know what information is going to come out on the other side as to why they made their decisions or how they got their decisions. Okay. Over. Okay, I don't have any more questions from the audience, so I think we'll uh, wrap it up. And just a reminder to uh, everyone that, as usual, for those of you who have participated as an audience member in these webinars in the past, uh, we will have this uh, webinar recorded uh, prob and probably posted to our website in 24, 48 hours, something like that. And as usual, I will send out an email to uh, all the members, and I'll you in on that as well, Warren, uh, once it's posted to our website. So if you want to review uh, Warren's uh, presentation on war crimes in the Ukraine, you can do that. And I want to thank you, Warren, uh, personally for uh, an excellent presentation on war crimes. And we appreciate your perspective on, uh, on the issue. And of course, its potential impact on the war in Ukraine. And of course, as you rightly point out, the war in Ukraine is by no means over. And there are undoubtedly many twists and turns, many of which will involve a war crimes investigation uh, to come over the next weeks, months, or whatever. And I also want to thank you for taking out the personal time to attend and put this together and uh, for our RUSI VI audience. And it's certainly very uh, topical and of uh, great interest. So again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Warren. Thank you, Scott. Pleasure to attend. And, and thank you for everybody for listening to my speed speak uh, as I tried to get through it all for you. <laughs> Thanks, Warren. And we'll uh, talk again about getting together for lunch. So uh, thank you very much. All right. That ends our webinar today. Goodbye.